Hi, Jeff. Hello, Anand. It's so nice to be with you. Ah, it's great to be with you too. It's a pleasure. So today my guest is Jeff Linderoth. He's the Harvey D. Spangler Professor in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He holds a courtesy appointment in the Computer Sciences Department and as a Discovery Fellow at the Wisconsin Institutes of Discovery. His research interests include optimization, integer programming, mixed integer nonlinear programming, and stochastic optimization. His awards include an earlier career award from the Department of Energy, the Scion Activity Group on Optimization Prize, and the Informs Computing Society Prize. In 2016, Jeff was elected to membership as an Informs Fellow. He also acted as an associate editor for highly important OR journals such as Operations Research, Informed Journal Computing, and Computational Optimization and Applications. In addition, he acted as consultant for more than 10 companies and supervised 11 PhD dissertations. Jeff, uh, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Uh, how are you? I'm honored to be here. Thank you for that uh, very nice uh, introduction, Anand. Yes. Uh, your, your actual name is Jeffrey, but nobody calls you like that, right? Only my mom calls me Jeffrey. <laughs> yeah, you even write Jeff in your papers. Right? I do write Jeff in my papers. Um, mm. Yeah, really, only my mother calls me Jeffrey. And <laughs> even then, probably only when I'm getting in, in trouble. <laughs> okay, uh, so you were born in 1970 in the U.S., but where specifically? I was born just outside of Chicago, Illinois, so uh, a Midwest, Midwest uh, kid. Mm -hmm. And what is your family background? So uh, I have two sisters, an older sister and a younger sister. Um, my father worked uh, as an accountant for an energy company. Um, and my mother, uh, for a long time, stayed at home with, with uh, the children and then went back to work. She worked uh, for a banking company. I finished my high school schooling. I went from the, you know, from time I was born more or less until the time I was, uh, you know, about 13 or 14 year olds when, when people in the U.S. start high school lived in Chicago. Um, then my family, because of my parents' job, uh, I switched high schools and we moved to Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, and then because of my parents' job, again, same company, but just moved twice during my high school years, actually. I ended up finishing my high school years uh, outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Wow. Uh, so you move around quite a bit. Uh, it should have been hard for you as a kid. I, I, I mean, I think we all learn to adapt, but but yes, I can't say, you know, going to three high schools, three different high schools would have been something that I would have uh, wished it wished to do. But, um, you know, those things perhaps make us more more resilient. Um, I, I have no no regrets. I made lots of great friends in all of those places. Mm -hmm. um... So how did you enjoy spending time uh, in your early days? Uh, were you into sports? I was a super sports kid. Like I played ever since the time I was so little. My mother likes to tell the story. She thought it was so funny because like she would be washing dishes and I would be in the backyard throwing up the baseball and hitting it. And then also commentating on this like made up game that I had going in my head, just running around and around. Um, and so I really, I played Little League and, you know, all through my, uh, Little League Baseball, I should say, all through my uh, growing up years. And then I also played a, a lot of basketball. I really loved to play basketball as well. In Chicago? So those were my, in, in Chicago. Like, so, ah. you know, a little bit before, uh, just, you know, I think I was right at the, right when we moved from Chicago, it was right about when Michael Jordan more or less came to Chicago if I'm getting if I'm getting the dates right. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah. So those I was I was a sports kid, but I also enjoyed um, I actually was quite uh, interested and played the trumpet quite a bit uh, started in, I don't know, when I was probably nine or ten. And I played that all the way uh, up until college. Um, and I enjoyed that very much and and played at one point in my life. I actually thought I wanted to be a professional musician. Wow. Uh, did you perform? Uh... Uh, yeah. So uh, especially, you know, as I got 
better. Uh, you know, I, I well, it started in, in Kentucky. I played with, you know, youth orchestras. And then it was fabulous when we when when I finished high school in Cleveland. You know, Cleveland has a world class orchestra, one of the top, you know, five or 10 orchestras in the world downtown at Severance Hall. And so I was the principal trumpet of the Cleveland Orchestra Youth Orchestra when I was finishing high school there. And we got conducted by, you know, like the the associate conductor at that time, Yakya Ling, and we had all these great people come through. So it was um, it was fabulous. Uh, it was a fabulous experience. And you know, besides that, I had a uh, a side job at playing my trumpet at weddings, and we had a brass quintet that played at different churches and things like that. So we performed a lot. Wow, I'm really impressed by that. And. Uh... Did you enjoy jazz like Miles Davis or were you more into classic music? Um, actually, those are the only two types of music that I really like are jazz and classical music. Uh -huh. uh, even even uh, when I was a kid, uh, I didn't ever really listen to anything except those those two types of music, kind of a, of a nerd that way. I remember the first well, back when you know CD players were just came out, I think I was living in Kentucky at that time, so it must have been about the mid '80s, and I was so excited I got a CD player. And the very first CD that I bought was the Shostakovich Fifth Symphony. <laughs> that was my. <laughs> in contrast to CD. other kids at that time. Maybe yeah, right. buying uh, at that time it was it was uh, Michael Jackson or you know other type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, other, 80s music. Yes, yes. Rod Rock, synth uh, rock bands and things like that. Uh, I have one curiosity. You mentioned the trumpet. Uh, can you play the trumpet solo of Penny Lane by the Beatles? Uh, no, that's a little bit beyond my skill level. I mean, I did. I actually had sold it, but I did have, I, you know, especially for playing at weddings at one point, I did have a piccolo trumpet that you would play more like trumpet voluntary and those types of like fanfares at the weddings. But that that is quite a complicated piece. Um, I, I think I tried it once. I mean, I could play it, but you wouldn't want to hear it. <laughs> okay, so do you think that the experience of performing in public helped you later in, in your career when it came to giving talks and teaching? Probably, I would say yes. I mean, I think it's a little bit more that, you know, it wasn't necessarily the performing and music specifically, but rather you know, I just I believe that, you know, the more experience or the more times you do something, just the better you get at it. Right. So it's a little bit more of just getting the reps in and that helps you be less nervous, gives you more experience for dealing with the types of situations that you're going to do. And so somehow I feel like it, it's it's a combination of that. You know, all your experiences, you know, help shape who you are. Mm hmm. Um... I noticed you have a degree in general engineering. Uh, can you be more specific about this? No, because that is actually my degree is actually in general engineering. So when I finished high school in Cleveland, um, I decided, uh, well, I was I was a math and science kid and I enjoyed mathematics very much, especially learning or understanding how you can use math to explain things or describe things. And so, you know, physics was very interesting to me at that time and just mathematics in general. So engineering was a, was a natural field of study for me. And then I went to the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, so going back you know, back to my roots back in Illinois, there's a wonderful engineering school there. And when I applied to the engineering school, I didn't know, like most, I mean, I was department chair uh, of industrial and systems engineering, and, you know, in the past, and it really is true that freshmen, they really don't know what they want to do. And I was just like one of those freshmen, I didn't know if I wanted to be an electrical engineer, a chemical engineer, a mechanical engineer. And at that time, Illinois had a degree program in quote unquote, general engineering. And I'm like, well, I guess I'll sign up for that thinking that I could change later if I realized that I really wanted to be an electrical engineer or something like that. And it was a, this general engineering degree program has since been uh, transformed actually into the the what I think, believe it's called industrial and enterprise systems engineering department and program at Illinois. So it really had some connections and roots tied to industrial engineering, but a little bit broader, lots of design classes and 
a, a broad training in engineering and circuits and fluid dynamics and, and thermodynamics and, and things like that. So, uh -huh. but I did actually finish, but I didn't end up switching. So I did finish my degree in general engineering. Mm -hmm. You mentioned general engineering uh, disciplines, uh, but did you have contact with OR or optimization during your undergrad years? Yeah, this actually, this was really, uh, obviously it was a little bit transformative, you know, for me, you know, as part of this general engineering program, essentially you were exposed at least to, to at least one basic course in each of the engineering disciplines. And so there was one quote unquote industrial engineering course where we learned like some of the fundamentals of engineering economics. Uh, I think a little bit of applied probability. And then I think the third module of that was in uh, optimization. And, and this was, I think in my junior year, early, I think maybe my first semester junior year where I was first saw an optimization problem and I was like, whoa, this is really cool. Um, you know, partly because it is again, using mathematics, you know, to gain understanding uh, about things, about a, a model or, or help people make decisions. And I thought this was really cool. The other, you know, really transformative thing that happened to me at Illinois was like, right, also starting in the summer of that junior year, I did an undergraduate research project uh, with a faculty member th there, Scott Burns, who he was a civil engineer by training, but actually used optimization in the in, to optimize structural designs. And so he um, numerical methods for nonlinear optimization, which essentially are, are, is required in that domain. And so I got to learn uh, learn a lot from Professor Burns, and just kept my you know, love of or interest in optimization growing and growing through my undergrad years. Right. Uh, in what language uh, were you coding in, in those days? That was, uh, well, I was, I mean, I was also a computer nerd, I should have said, growing up. So I was, I was, you know, even before, you know, I went, when I was in high school, we would, I knew how to program in machine language of the Apple IIe computer. Um, but the first, and so I already knew some other languages back then. Pascal was a big language, but the first course that we, that you take back then was in Fortran. Thankfully it wasn't, I'm not old enough for it to be on punch cards, but <laughs> it was, uh, CS 101 at Illinois then was, was in Fortran and which was great because that's the research that what I was doing with professor Burns also, that was, you know, obviously Fortran was, and still is a great language for numerical computing. So that was all Fortran, mm -hmm. uh, at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So after graduating, you moved again, uh, this time to Atlanta uh, for your PhD. Yes. Yeah, so uh, 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 Professor Burns was actually instrumental in having me choose to go to uh, Georgia Tech. I, you know, I, you know, at, you know, by the time I was a junior or senior, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school, specifically in computational optimization. Uh, because I really liked, you know, the computational side of these, of these algorithms. And I applied to many different grad schools. I got into a few, not into all, um, but I was, was lucky to get into Georgia Tech. And as soon as I got into Georgia Tech, Professor Burns said, you should definitely go there. That is like where all the optimization people really are, the computational optimization people, especially. So he sort of pointed me, what I think is in the right direction to Georgia Tech. Uh -huh. There, you had the chance to meet great OR legends, including George Nemhauser, Alice Johnson, and Martin Salzberg, the latter uh, your PhD advisor. Can you tell me what did you learn from each of them uh, and how influential they were to you? Oh, gosh, I, I can't do that. Uh, you know, I can't answer that question in the short amount of time that we have. Um, but maybe I can just say a word or two about um, what I admire, you know, a, a lot about uh, all of them because they all taught me so many different things and I couldn't have been in a better place. Maybe first starting with uh, George. Um, George is, of course, uh, everyone knows is a legend in our field, you know, really like, and, but he did so much for that group at Georgia Tech, especially the students as well, for all of us. So, I mean, I worked on some projects with George. He was never my advisor, but regardless to, to all of us, he was always like Papa George. Um, he would 
give us advice. He would sort of tell us what courses we needed to take and from whom, and you know, and he was very influential. Um, I think when I, you know, he was the one who I think when I was trying to figure out what to do after Georgia Tech, who was calling people to say, oh, you should think about hiring, you know, this Linderoth kid or giving me advice like that. So George, you know, I mean, one of the things I admire about him most you know, is of course he was he did brilliant work in integer programming, but just that he was just such a great leader and an empathetic leader of that group. Um, you know, what can I say about Ellis Johnson? Ellis Johnson, you, you know, I think frankly is I think has to be at the very top of the most brilliant people that I've ever met. So I when I first started working, when I got there as a as a very green fresh. Uh, PhD student, I've started working with Ellis on some problems and he, he just was at a different level, you know, that than I was then. And I think it's, it's still at a different level than, than where I am, am now, like uh, his, his brilliant insights, you couldn't always understand, you know, maybe there's a difference that the genius is you couldn't always understand what he was saying or trying to tell you. So you'd feverishly write down what he was writing on the board and you go back and think about it for a long time. And I have a lot of my Georgia Tech peers at the time will say the same thing. When you talk, when Ellis tells you something, you write it down, you will think about it for a while. And, and eventually or occasionally you'll get that Eureka moment about like what he was really trying to tell you. And like, this is, you know, and it would be like, this is just the way you're supposed to think about that particular problem. He was such a, uh, you know, be able to just get to the heart of things and like not make it, you know, not make it any more simple or complicated than it need to be, but like just ex explain it the right way. That's, you know, so I, I enjoyed, I learned, you know, so much from him. And then about my third year into the, in, into my time at Georgia Tech, I was still going around. I had done many different projects. I worked on, you know, applied projects, you know, with the airlines and with um, industrial gas company, I'd worked on a, a modeling language for optimization problems written entirely in SQL. I'd done a, I'd done a project on polyhedral theory of the convex hull of circuits with Martin and a postdoc, Petra Bauer. But around that time, Martin, I think, had a grant to do computational integer programming, but specifically it's uh, algorithms and building a software for solving integer programs on distributed memory computers, so parallel integer programming. Uh, what I admire most about Martin is just his sheer capacity for getting things getting things done. He is so efficient. Um, and part of that, I think, it, it becomes he doesn't flounder around. He also, a little bit like Ellis, perhaps like Genius, can quickly and easily just get to the heart of the matter on, techno, on technical issues. He was a very caring advisor for me. I couldn't have asked for a better advisor. And I hope that I, you know, that, you know, I hope that I am as half a good advisor to, I have been to my PhD students as Martin was to me. Wow, this is just great recollections. Uh, and uh, I can easily tell that you really admire them. And it's nice to see how they influenced you. Uh, in, in your uh, professional life. Um, your PhD research was in parallel integer programming, as you just mentioned. Uh, tell me more about that. Well, well, at that time, um, I actually, maybe I'll just back up just a moment to say that, you know, at that time in the mid nineties, when I was doing my PhD, you know, to the, to the late nineties, um, it was an exciting time for computational integer programming in the sense that the best solvers in the world were the solvers that academics were working on. And Martin and George specifically had this solver called Minto, which, you know, by the end of my time working with Martin, you know, I was had the keys, you know, I was given access to the Minto source code. So he trusted me enough. So I actually was working with you know the, the the best integer programming software, uh, Minto at that time it was before Cplex sort of took over. It was, um, and and so the the thought of this 
of my PhD thesis was okay. So now th these were all sequential codes running on a single on a single uh, processing unit, but of course, branch and bound is an inherently uh, uh, you know can be distributed process. It's not you know completely you know, or naturally parallel. It's not like a Monte Carlo, but indeed you know separate parts of a branch and bound tree can be evaluated independently. Um, and the the research questions we were trying to explore were sure you can you know you can do these things completely independently but the fundamental question question was when and how much information uh should be shared between the processors like how much synchronization is required and is you know information that you're collecting in the search on processor one is it worth it to send it to processor two kind of is in terms of the overhead versus the benefit that might be so that was sort of like, I would say the, the thesis of my thesis was to try to understand, you know, what types of information in the, in the sort of, in, an, in a modern branch and bound solver uh, is useful to share between the processors. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you develop your computer skills uh, coming all the way from Fortran? Uh, I'm asking this because at the time internet was only starting and, and you did not have forums like Stack Overflow largely available as we do now. Yeah, thank you for making me feel old. It, indeed, the <laughs> internet was just starting. and But they at least had something called news groups. I don't know if the kids today will remember what news groups were. They were sort of like Reddit threads, I suppose. <laughs> Um, on specific topics where people could ask questions and you could, there was a sci.op research news group, but there were also like comp.unix uh, uh, news groups. And, and as one of my roles at Georgia Tech, I, at, for many years, I was in charge, uh, like the system administrator of the, of the cluster of computational resources at the time they were, um, RS 6000s running IBM AIX. And so I had to learn, you know, I would read lots of books. I have a huge collection of books, not just on mathematics and mathematical optimization, but also on like Unix system programming and system administration and programming languages and things like that as well. So it was, yeah, it's, but I, I do agree with you, Anand. It is so much easier today that I can put anything that I want to know how to do into Stack Overflow and I can immediately sort of see how to implemented in my uh -huh. Python program or whatever I'm writing you know, yeah. at the time. I don't want you to feel really old, but I wonder <laughs> if you uh, also had the chance to submit papers by mail at that time, or it was al already electronically. We were all, I believe all of my papers were submitted electronically. So uh, I think that's okay. I know that there were other, there were a few journals and people were still submitting papers by mail back around then, but I believe we, all of my papers uh, have, were all submit. Uh, uh, okay. So I don't make you feel yeah, that. No, old. Yeah. I feel, I feel young again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you went back once again to Illinois after completing your PhD. Yeah. So I had a, well, well, when I finished my PhD, it took me six years because I was having such a great time doing all of these fun things and fun projects, but eventually uh, I, I like to tell my students, like being a PhD student is like, I think it's like the greatest job in the whole wide world, except you're kind of poor, yeah. right? And so after, for a while, after you get tired of being poor, you have to sort of move on. Um, and it was interesting. I had three different job offers, one in academia uh, at, a, at a research one institution, one actually working for a computational optimization software company, and the third was to do a postdoc at Argonne National Lab, working primarily on this project called Meta Neos, which was very similar to my research in that, you know, Neos is this very well known uh, network enabled optimization service yes. that was solving optimization problems and it had great, you know, over the internet and had a lot of great people working on that. Steve Wright, Jorge Nosadal, Jorge Moray. Um, and this, this particular project was to solve optimum they called it meta neos because the cloud-based computing and distributed computing was called a meta computer at that time and so this whole large project uh, led by steve wright was on solving optimization problems using 
these meta computing resources. And so this sounded this sounded great to me. It was a great fit with my background. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, and it's one of the best decisions I think I ever made in my life. It sounds kind of crazy when you have like a, a real job or a long term job, even at a, at a tier one research institution to take a postdoc. But in, in retrospect, I think it was the, one of the best decisions I made in my life. Uh, I, I, I encourage all PhD students, whenever I meet with them, if they can afford to, to, to do a postdoc. It broadens your horizon so much. Uh, you can learn so many more things, and it certainly did for me. Yeah, it's very interesting for you to say that. I've seen people advocating uh, towards the opposite, that you know those that are just finishing their PhD should not look for postdocs because they're underpaid and things like that. But I think it depends on the case and the situation. And if one can really afford to do it, it's uh, very uh, interesting and it helps one to develop uh, further skills too, right? So. Yeah, I mean, it really is. I guess I will say again, this was many years ago where likely the pay gap between, especially in our field, what is typically paid, especially with an academic postdoc and what you can make doing optimization or machine learning and AI mm -hmm. in industry wasn't quite as large back then. So that in some sense made the, this, my decision, you know, not as difficult, but it was definitely, I, I mean, if you view it as an investment in this case, you know, I, 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 that investment, I believe really paid off for me. It was one I would do again. Mm -hmm. uh, you did not stay there very long, right? Uh, just two years in the postdoc, uh, and then an opportunity arose actually to move back to Atlanta. So actually, I got um, I met my wife. We we both were actually graduate students at uh, Georgia Tech together. We actually came in the same year, uh, 1992. My wife for her my now wife for her master's, and and me for my uh, PhD. So she left after two years. We didn't date at that time. She took a job at consulting. She moved back to Atlanta and I was one of the, because it took me six years to get my PhD. I was one of the few people that she knew that was left in Atlanta. But when she came back, then we started dating um, and we were engaged in Atlanta and married in Chicago. Um, but my wife missed Atlanta and she had an opportunity and we both had an opportunity, her to go to work at the CDC in Atlanta and me uh, to join a startup company in Atlanta that was started by, uh, called Axioma, that was started by Sebastian Seria and actually by Martin Salzberg. So this was an exciting opportunity uh, that I thought I couldn't pass up. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, did you feel excited, uh, you know, working in the industry? Um, or actually that was a point that you realized that academia was, your, was the right place for you? You know, that's a great question, Anand. Like, I was super excited actually working at Axioma, and I learned so much working there as well. So, again, just if there's a theme to this, you know, like being, a, you know, absorbing new things and, and moving around, like, I, I learned so much about how to be a professional programmer there. It was a very small company, so we had to do lots of different things. I was you know, programming parts of the, you know, so Axioma, I should should maybe back up a moment. Axioma at that time was primarily interested in building and selling software for doing uh, optimization of portfolios, you know, to, you know, hedge funds and mutual funds. Um, and it was a small company. So I was involved in, of course, some of the numerical optimization, but I was also helping to write the Java GUI interface. I was going out on sales calls. I was, you know, the network system administrator. Um, and so that part of it, I really liked, you know, being able to, you know, do, do all of those things. Um, one thing I think I did find out about myself is that, you know, I, I feel like I didn't necessarily have the entrepreneurial gene or bone, like I didn't, really feel like necessary that I needed to like be running my own organization or anything like that, 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 that doesn't really appeal to me. I think I found out there. Um, but no, I loved it there. It was, it was a great job. And I, I probably would still could very well still be there today and be far, far, far more wealthy. <laughs> um, if, you know, in, uh, I, I guess it was around 2002, um, well, things weren't looking so good for the economy, nor for Axioma back then. 
as it turned out, my wife had just got pregnant. And so I thought I needed to go get a job where I was would have more reliable income. And here's a point in the story where Papa George plays another important role, because it was just while I was trying to figure out what to do with my life, I had gone back to Georgia Tech as an employee of Axioma and gave a talk in their regular seminar series about you know portfolio optimization. And George, he was so kind, he came up to me after the talk and he said, Linda Roth, you should be a professor. And I said, you know why, George? I didn't think you ever really were that impressed with me as a student, but uh, he's just joking around. He's like, no, because you, it's obvious that obvious that you like you really love teaching and you love to present things and you explain things very well. So I really, you really should be a be a professor. And so that stuck with me. Mm-hmm. And so, when one of my old friends from Georgia Tech, uh, Joe Hartman, happened to be in town in Atlanta visiting. Uh, his uh his brother-in-law we, w- we went out to dinner and he, joe, joe was at lehigh university at the time and joe's like you should apply we have to have an open position at lehigh university and so i applied to that one position and i was lucky enough to get to get an offer at lehigh so i moved to lehigh in 2002. Mm-hmm. so you continued with your peregrination through the united states yes <laughs> this time uh you went to pennsylvania right yes bethlehem pennsylvania yeah and uh you made some interesting progress on solving large quadratic assignment problems around that time right well that actually was started that that was an artifact of the meta neos project so this is i guess maybe it's sort of um shows how long it takes things to get published in our community but you know the solution you know one of the things like that i was most proud of this was happened during my time as a postdoc you know, partly because of the great leadership of Steve Wright on this project, but he gave us the freedom to work on these things. And we had a very talented uh, summer student, Nate Brixius, come to visit us at Argonne and work with me, and also with his advisor, Kurt Anstryker, and another colleague and friend, Jean-Pierre Gou. We, you know, sort of put together, you know, some of the great ideas Nate and Kurt were doing about computationally effective bounding methods for this notoriously difficult combinatorial optimization problem known as the quadratic assignment problem, together with some, you know, intelligent, clever branching methods um, and load balancing methods to run on these meta computers, we were able to solve this, you know, 30 year old open challenge problem, this size 30 Nugent quadratic assignment problem. But that was in the roughly the year 2000, I think, uh-huh. that that was solved. But, you know, I guess uh, I was able to sort of continue a lot of that momentum, you know, going through, I, you know, and I'm pretty sure that when I gave my, my job talk at Lehigh, I was still talking about that uh-huh. uh, type of thing. And so the paper appeared around then. But that actually came out of work that it was done at Argonne, actually. Yeah, that's when you started to uh, become known in the community, probably, right? I think so. You know, that that paper, of course, did make a splash. That won the SIAM Activity Group on Optimization Prize. Uh, also, when I was at Argonne, uh, it was it was great that Alex Shapiro, also from Georgia Tech, but so, uh, a professor I didn't really interact with much there, but he came to visit Steve Wright at Argonne uh, one summer, and I spent a lot of time with Alex. And this is um, how Steve and Alex and I started doing some work in stochastic optimization. Um, And so we also, Steve Wright and I had written a paper on how to do, uh, solve two large, to solve two stage stochastic linear programs on the meta computer. And that paper, I believe, uh, that paper I believe won a prize and I was well regarded in the community. And one of my most highly cited papers was on some other empirical work we did with Alex and Steve, just showing that was that was back at the time when some of the early results on doing sampled approximations to stochastic programs were coming out. And Alex, of course, was instrumental in building a lot of that theory about that these things could potentially work remarkably well. And we were able to verify a lot of that theory empirically in this mm-hmm. other paper. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, you moved once again. <laughs> I think I lost track, maybe the ninth time. Uh, but uh, this time you decided to stay for good. 
Yeah, ninth time, best time. Yeah, so in, in 2007, I, I had an opportunity to move uh, to, to University of Wisconsin-Madison, which was in some sense was always a dream job of mine, going back to my time of this Meta Neos project, because the Meta Neos project was joint with people at Aragon, Northwestern, and University of Wisconsin. And so I already had great colleagues there like Michael Ferris. Um, and at that point, Steve Wright, you know, had joined University of Wisconsin. And so and Steve Wright, you know, University of Wisconsin is, you know, has this long and rich history of just being, uh, you know, a leader in mathematical optimization, going back to Olvi Mangasarian and Steve Robinson. Uh, and Steve Robinson was very instrumental in recruiting me to come to Madison in 2007. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, at some point you started working on mixed integer nonlinear uh, optimization or programming. Uh, how did that happen and how was the adaptation? Did you have any mentorship? So this was this was a very interesting how that came about. So I was at Lehigh at the time and Jorge Moray, who was at uh, Argonne when I was there, and Sven Leifer, uh, who was very well known in nonlinear programming, uh, asked me to join them to create a short course for the SIAM optimization meeting in Stockholm. And I think it was going to be in 2003. Um, and, and I was like, well, I don't really know anything about mixed integer nonlinear programming. And, and Sven, I said, don't worry, like, because Sven had done his thesis on mixed integer nonlinear programming, but his real expertise, I would say, is more on the continuous side of things, you know, like the NLP. And so it's like, you can be the MI person, and I'll be the NLP person, and then together we'll do MI NLP. Um, and conquer and the world. So, <laughs> and conquer the world, yeah, indeed. <laughs> and um, so that gave me, you know, the opportunity to actually read a lot of the great early papers like by Ignacio Grossman and others um, on how, but like also in reading those papers had me think about like, oh, but wait, here's how, you know, integer programming's come a long way. How can we adapt some of these more modern ideas from mixed integer linear programming into the nonlinear world? Um, they were ideas that were very natural, let's say low hanging fruit. And so as a, as a young researcher, you know, especially one who, who isn't tall enough to reach the, the, the high hanging fruit, I guess I'll say this was great because we could make do some do some quote unquote simple things, but also have, I would say, you know, with, for, with some relatively large impact by just applying well known ideas from from sort of the discrete linear pro integer programming world into mixed integer nonlinear programming, I think at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the next years, you have done a lot of theoretical and practical work in the field of optimization. Uh, which ones did you enjoy the most? I've enjoyed them all. That's like saying, which child, which child do you love the most, Anand? <laughs> but um, maybe one other paper that I think, uh, I, especially from back from that time that I'm especially proud of is our work, uh, computational work on uh, exploiting symmetry in the context of solving uh, just integer linear programs. So this was joint work with a very creative, talented PhD student who got his, his um, PhD at Lehigh named Jim Ostrowski and is now at University of Tennessee. Um, and so the idea there was, you know, to instead of trying to, to break symmetries, um, you know, symmetry, it can be very, can be make it very difficult to solve an integer program because essentially by branching, you sort of are looking at essentially isomorphic regions of the search space. Um, but the idea behind orbital branching and some of these other methods was to exploit that exploit that symmetry um, instead and sort of use knowledge about what the symmetric structure was there to search more intelligently. So you weren't uh, looking at these isomorphic regions and save a lot of uh, computation. Right. That, that sounds fascinating. Uh, do you have any other child that we, you would like to comment about oh, i do have i do have one child yeah so <laughs> who i like more than if he's listening i like i like you jacob more than all of my papers put together yeah so i have one one son jacob who's in his uh, sophomore year of college now right yeah that's that's important to mention uh so 
What about uh, your very recent paper entitled The Hierarchical Organization of Autocatalytic Reaction Networks and Its Relevance to Origin of Life? Sounds rather oh. fancy for an R person. <laughs> I, I well, this is I'm proud of this paper and that is I think my first paper that's in sort of biology in a biological application or biological domain, and I can't wait to give a talk on this where I sort of will title it is like integer programming explains the origin of life. <laughs> this is a, I think this is a, that's a little bit uh, that's a bait. <laughs> that's a little, yeah, that's a little bit far fetched, but it's an interesting paper and in that is an application of integer programming in the field of, I guess it's called astrobiology, where they want to try to understand, given a bunch of chemicals and a potential reactions among those chemicals, you know, how could those organize themselves, you know, maybe in sequence to um, create additional chemicals and then therefore have additional reactions and then build upon itself. So there's this theory that that's how that's how you know count these complex uh, natural systems such as life you know evolve from a very relatively sort of simple beginning and the integer programming was used to just help them search for some of these what they call autocatalytic cycles which is a uh, a series of reactions that can sort of feed itself uh, it's, a, it's sort of just a little it's, it's a quite simple application of, of integer programming with a very fancy title. Um, I continue working on that a little bit, like helping them, you know, uh, with sort of uh, more complicated uh, uses of integer programming, putting multiple, you know, sort of cycles together, I guess. Yeah, that's great and only shows how optimization is something that is ubiquitous in a way, right? It's all over the place. Yeah. And integer I can, programming, yeah. Yeah, I just can't get tired of, you know, uh, uh, these new applications, you know, the more technology uh, advances uh, or science, you end up finding new uh, opportunities to apply uh, optimization methods, and that's just uh, great and fascinating. So, uh, so you were a department chair until very recently. Um, I know Laura Albert. She was here as a guest. Yeah, we uh, all know Laura Albert. Yes. Yeah, she's the one occupying the, that position nowadays. Uh, what did you learn from this experience and what differences you see between your leadership style and hers? I learned from this experience that I don't want to be a dean uh, anywhere and that, um, you know, I, I enjoyed the experience very much, especially the ability to help my colleagues. Um, uh, I, I really value my colleagues in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering so much. And so it was it was a joy and a pleasure to work for them uh, to, to try to, to make that place better. Um, but mostly I learned, you know, I think, you know, I learned one. I mean, you learn things that, you know, aren't, aren't so relevant in the field of mathematical optimization. Right. But you learn how to have hard conversations with people. Um, I, I learned how to uh, I got a lot more experience at actually just like having to quickly develop solutions to like, um, you know, procedural problems and things like that. So, I mean, this isn't so exciting or relevant, but, you know, that being said, you know, I did enjoy my time in that role, but I enjoyed even more stepping down from that role uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, no, last year. And I was so happy um, that Laura uh, was able to take over uh, you know and sort of carry the carry the mantle forward you know you know you asked how she was different yes that i am in that role so i mean so first she's she's better she's probably she's more busy than i was um you know I, I think she's doing a fabulous job she's probably more empathetic to to people i was um i guess she's, she's probably less i was quite a hands-on leader like i was uh, Whereas I think Laura is more a leader in that delegating, delegating activities than, than I was. But, you know, I guess that's how, Yeah. from my perspective, that's what I see as some of the differences. Right. Uh, let's see if Laura agrees with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. She better. Yeah. Uh, so since you've learned how to handle, you know, hard conversations and face this, uh, 
challenging scenarios. Now I'm going to give you a hard time asking a few questions. Uh, that Great, bring, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, I've been practicing for, I practiced for five years. <laughs> so Jeff, I see there is a gap between theory and practice when it comes to implementing optimization algorithms, especially the exact uh, algorithms. In general, uh, you really need close mentorship to be able to do this in a decent way. Do you agree with this? And if so, what do you think uh, one can do to improve this scenario? I think I do agree with that. Um, and, you know, in implementing, you know, say more advanced, non-traditional textbook, you know, implementations of our optimization algorithms, if that's what you're speaking yes. of, like sort of like column generation and vendor decomposition and, you yeah. know, and branch and price and things that, you know, they are in textbooks. So, you know, the theory is there and you could implement them, but, you know, the, just because, you know, you do what the book says doesn't mean it actually works. Uh, and there's lots of tricks that come with experience in, in making, making things work. Um, there is a gap. I don't know if there's a gap between theory and practice more than there is just a gap in maybe in the literature uh, and that there is, as far as I know, no real book, you know, a great book of where all of these tricks of the trade essentially, you know, are written down. Um, I don't know why that is. Uh, it's probably a difficult book to write, you mm -hmm. know, because it really is, you know, it's just sort of ad hoc things, you know, that tend to work well, that had come from intuition, you know, not necessarily with a huge amount of supporting theory. You have either a geometric intuition or maybe some, you know, mathematical, you know, intuition, you know, that it, that it may work. So that, that could be why, or maybe the people that know how to do what they want to keep themselves important and corner the market and always be the ones that people need to go to if they if they need help. I don't know, but I agree with you very much, Anand, that it does require some significant expertise um, that's not in textbooks, I believe, to, to sort of really engineer algorithms that work well for large scale problems. Mm -hmm. That's just true. And do you believe that the hype involving AI and machine learning methods can discourage the younger generation to pursue higher studies in mathematical optimization, especially in the US? Uh, well, certainly the hype in AI and, and data science is probably overall helping, you know, students study fields that are close to optimization, you know, mathematical statistics, you know, single signal processing, which, you know, those types of things. And of course, mathematical optimization has a, has, has a huge role to play in machine learning. And probably most people listening to this podcast believe, you know, whatever growing role needs to be played. So in that sense, I don't think it's, um, you know, necessarily that discouraging, you know, it's not discouraging for the students where, where, where I think the, where the, there's a, there's a potential difficulty for the theory of, you know, optimization or even the theory of machine learning is that, you know, because of its wild success, you know, some of the very best and brightest of the people who are who have that training are not going into the business of training others. You know, they are going into the business of building systems and uh, frankly, making this probably a significantly larger amount of money um, and those things as well. And so, you know, we sort of, I think, sort of see that, uh, you know, when we're trying to hire postdocs uh, uh, and things as well, yeah. Even higher hiring um, faculty, you know, faculty in that area. You know, you're not just competing against, you know, MIT and Georgia Tech and Stanford and University of Washington and Cornell and all these Northwestern, all these other great schools. You're competing against, you know, Amazon and Lyft and Uber and Google, and so it's just uh, makes it harder. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you have the impression that less people are trying to, you know, uh, follow this path? compared to 10 or 20 years ago? In, uh, in mathematical, mathematical optimization? optimization? Exactly. Yeah, actually, no, I don't have that uh, impression, uh, personally. Um, I think, you know, mathematics, you know, it was never a hugely, you know, popular mm -hmm. subdomain of applied mathematics or whatever you want to sort of put it anyway. And so I think, you know, it might be, you know, in my, I guess in my take on it is that, you know, 
you know, there's probably some people being drawn out, you know, from mathematical optimization into say more statistical learning theory. We got those before, but you know, they're, you're pulling more people in as well because you know it's sort of like AI adjacent, I guess. You know, so we we sort of both lose and win maybe from the proximity of optimization to ML and AI, where it, from what I can say, I don't necessarily see any like great decrease in, in mm -hmm. interest from say American PhD students okay. and from 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you think that researchers receive proper credit and recognition for developing optimization software? Oh God, no, of course not. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they really don't. It's, um, yeah, they, they just don't. Um, uh, I don't know how to change that. I mean, there have been, you know, we've created some great journals, mathematical programming computation, I think is, it's one of my favorite journals to read where, you know, now there can be an avenue for like doing software and getting a publication, you know, about the software Informs journal on computing also now has a software section. So it's becoming easier for, uh, academics anyway, to both write software and publish on it, but still writing like usable software for other people, a, you know, is a huge effort, right? Funding agencies, you know, don't really give a lot of, uh, money money towards that and so they're just really you know it's it's a kind of a sad uh state of affairs and at least in the united states i can say that it's very difficult you know to you know make your career uh as an academic you know writing writing software that, that other people can use yeah because there are so many uh scholars that are really talented uh when it comes to programming uh, but in order to survive, they sometimes have to give away uh, what they can do better in order to, you know, survive. So they go, you know, to publish papers and things like that. But ultimately, uh, we lose, I think, uh, the, the community loses a bit uh, when you don't see those bright minds uh, coding and generating a nice uh, software for, you know, the general public to use, not only uh, practitioners, but also us fr from academia. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is true that like, I mean, if you go into the into Garobi or Cplex or Cardinal Op or, or FICO Express, I mean, the, the, the people they have there are brilliant. Like most of them are wizards and, you know, are could all many of them have been in the past or could be very successful academics that have just decided not to publish and instead focus on writing software. So I, I don't know if I, I don't know if it would be true that like if um, our software, our would our integer programming solvers be any faster uh -huh. if if all of those people were in academia and and but that was properly uh, rewarded? I, I doubt it. I mean, it, but but what would be different is that that software would be in you know not making you know not not black box. It yeah. would be in the public domain. Yeah. It would be open source. So that that's a that's a relatively big loss for the open source community. I mean, these solvers all give licenses free to academics, but it does lessen the impact of optimization in the broader world if people have to buy commercial licenses in order to 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 solve their problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I should say give a shout out to Julian Hall and the Hyzopt group, because like now this is an F effort coming out of Edinburgh where they, they you know, uh, they are building a, a first class solver uh that's you know not at garobi not at the very not at the very very top levels of commercial solvers but but close and reliable and this is an open source you know to the point of where now when people you know ask me you know they, they have an optimization problem they want to solve and it's sort of like a medium scale to large scale problem in the past i'd be like you're going to have to invest in a commercial solver if you want to solve this you know in operations and in practice. And now I think that's less true. Um, you should maybe evaluate whether that's true, but uh, that this is a great, I think it's going to be a great step forward for our community. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I heard about that project uh, and uh, w uh, what I was actually referring is open source software, of course, because we rely mostly on commercial packages. And sometimes if you want to make some uh, contribution or if you want to study a particular aspect uh, of the uh, integer programming algorithm, if you have the open source uh, 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 code available, 
perhaps we can advance more and even faster uh, in developing uh, interesting methods. Uh, but right now we are kind of stuck to, to, to uh, relying on the, this uh, uh, softwares like Zplex and Groby and, you know, that are yeah, I think closed softwares. I, I think it's like an interesting, you know, it's an interesting point, like, because once upon a time, you know, like I was saying back in the, in the mid 90s, you know, when the academic software, you know, were the best, you know, you really could write an integer programming paper, you would have, you would implement an idea show that it sort of like beat the the best that was out there and then you could get your paper but you know like it was many years ago like integer pro you know if you were trying to beat the commercial solvers you know as an academic and integer program and you were going to go out of business kind of like because they you know they they had sort of you know not only did they hire really brilliant people but they also they had the benefit of like having to they have rated all the literature and implementing the best ideas that exist and the open literature. So like now what I hope for as an integer programmer for someone who wants to have an impact is to to write a paper that's promising enough for the commercial solver vendors to implement it in their software. And so like sometimes they'll contact me, should we try this? You know, should we try that? You know, and there are I'm very proud of there are two or three of my tricks from some of my papers that uh, have made it into like many of the commercial mm -hmm. solvers now. Wow, that's brilliant. Jeff, uh, some people in our field, uh, especially those who are more math oriented, are never too impressed by the efforts made by good researchers who attempt to develop serious heuristic and meta heuristic based algorithms for combinatorial optimization problems. Um, even to the point of claiming that such non exact methods are uh, not scientifically relevant. Uh, I'm not talking about, you know, the metaphor based heuristics, <laughs> I'm talking about you know, the, the, the serious ones. Uh, what is your take on this matter? I think it's a matter of taste. So first of all, like these uh, heuristics like Lynn Kernigan or GRASP or, you know, large scale uh, local search, these are extremely important. Um, and I think they're extremely clever ideas. And I think they're, they're, they're very important. I think, you know, the people with more of a math background probably don't like them because it is probably true there's a little bit less you can say mathematically about them i mean there are things you can say um but it's you know they don't give provable you know guarantees like one of the things when i teach my math optimization class is that like and i say you know this is the beauty of mathematical optimization is that like not only will it get you a very good solution but it can tell you how close that solution is to being the best in sort of a very precise sense. So like, you know, many people in our field have, uh, myself included actually, um, just have a have a preference for working on methods of that type, but that's that really is just a, a preference. It, it shouldn't, in my opinion, it shouldn't be used to demean these other very important works because I, they often work better than uh, you know, say heuristic type methods that are very closely tied to math optimization methods, you know, like even, you know, Bill Cook's like wonderful Concord solver, this is amazing solver, like sometimes, so that, you know, they use a variety of different heuristics to get high quality solutions, but maybe they're iterated Lynn Kernigan, but like now, as far as I, I think the last time I talked to him, he said the best one was a genetic algorithm, right? So, which sort of seems, you know, um, you're not necessarily so mathematically inspired, but hey, if it works, it works. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you even need the, the really good uh, primal bounds to, to prove optimality, right? Some some uh, exact algorithms heavily rely on these bounds, you know, to do reduce cost fixing and also, of course, improving the performance of branch and bound, branch and cut, branch and price methods. So yeah, I, I always thought found that like I went, when I was on my in my thesis, uh, it's a very minor throwaway, but like I tried, it didn't work as well as I had hoped it would, but like, you know, would try to uh, just guess, like pretend this was the optimal solution because in many of these problems, yeah, doing that type of dual fixing, like you say, can then you can pre-process the problem and it solves like that. So mm -hmm. if you just happen to not like be too aggressive in your guess, uh, that you can solve a problem, you know, that would no, there'd be no other way you could solve that problem unless you actually somehow did get lucky or have a great heuristic yeah. to find that solution. But just guessing like the value 
can really help you. Yeah, I agree. That's a good insight. And yeah, uh, right. Uh, I know uh, you have a vast experience as associate editor of leading or journals. Uh, do you think that sometimes we are too hard on ourselves when reviewing papers? Uh, absolutely. I should say I have less vast experience. I stepped out, you know, when I became department chair, because I was being a little more hands-on, I quickly realized that I was doing an even worse job as an associate editor, editor than I normally would. And so I stepped down from those roles. Um, uh, but that being said, uh, even back then, and I think it's even true to this day, is that I, I do feel like our community, the operations research community, compared to other communities, that uh, other scientific communities, we really are a little bit harder on ourselves than we need to be, probably. You know, we really require, you know, if you want to be in a, get in a quote unquote A plus journal, you know, we require, seemingly we require like some great new problem with some fantastic, you know, model and then great theory and algorithms and then an implementation that shows that you could solve this you know problem you know better than everyone else you need to put together all of these pieces of things it's not just like one or two clever ideas that you know can be published in there it has to be like this whole big you know project and you know that's a that's that that makes these papers fabulous to read but it's also you know sort of is discouraging to probably discouraging to many you know members of our field and also can slow down the progress a little bit as you, as you wait for these like big things to come along. So as I'm getting older, maybe I'm just getting soft in my old age, but like as I'm getting a little bit older in refereeing papers, I am trying to be much more optimistic instead of going in with a, like a, a mindset, like I have to find the mistakes and the things that are wrong in this paper. I try to go in with a mindset as like, this is, let's find some reasons to like this paper. Like what's positive about this paper. And that makes a huge difference. Just actually going in with that mindset uh, about what your end verdict are going to be. This is actually more from like review, reviewing papers, I would say that than, than edited my role as editor. Yeah, that's a great message. Uh, and I think uh, being positive doesn't mean that we are going to be less, uh, meticulous in Rigor the reviewing process. Yeah, rigorous. rigorous it yeah. won't. No. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. Like you can you can actually, you know, you can provide positive, constructive feedback, not just, you know, that this yeah. is wrong. Or... Right. Uh, Jeff, it's no secret that many editorial board members from Informs journals belong to a limited number of institutions, as shown in a recent paper by Professor Margaret Brando from Stanford. For example, I noticed that there are more than 10 members from Columbia University in the editorial board of the Journal Operations Research, uh, which is, for example, way more than the total number of members based uh, in Latin American institutions. What is your opinion about this? And don't you think it's about time to change these figures? Yeah, I, I guess you're right. I, mean, I guess we should say, you know, Columbia is a very strong university. So, you know, if there were to be 10 people from any university, I suppose that would be as, as good as any. Uh, that being said, I, I completely agree with you, Anand, that it's uh, it's important. And I really applaud uh, uh, Margaret for, for writing that paper and sort of trying to bring this even more out you know, in the open and to light. Um, I will also say, like I actually know firsthand, I, I had the opportunity to do, uh, to help uh, lead a review of the Operations Research Journal you know, just last year, or was it last year or the year before, I as to say, I think John Burge is doing a very good job with the journal and they are well aware of this issue and are trying to do things, you know, to sort of mitigate that impact. You know, a lot of the times um, the, the, these sort of, these close knit and these cliques can build within uh, sub areas within the journal and trying to sort of, um, you know, sort of break those sort of like, those particular areas that are potentially too insular by again, introducing geographic diversity and even, you know, other types of diversity. I think, you know, I don't know if it's a, you know, a, a sort of under appreciated form of diversity and, and like academic diversity is like a, lo a lot of the people on these journals are getting their PhDs from the same place. 
and you know maybe from the same advisor a group of advisors you know um and that's a large influence but like again it gets a little bit too much into group think right so that's the whole point of being whatever diversity is whether it's geographic demographic or even like this sort of like it's just you know even not coming being at the same institution or getting your phd from the same institution is to just try to like make sure that they they, they have a openness you know to a wider variety of ideas and so I mean, certainly, certainly, and I know Informs is aware of this, Operations Research is aware of this. You know, it's not something that's sort of easy to change overnight, I would say, but um, uh, I, I'm with you in, in hoping for a better world where the, these editorial boards are, are much more diverse. Uh -huh. And talking about, you know, journals and we think of indicators, uh, What's your opinion about uh, impact factor and then H index uh, for the authors and, you know, things like that? Yeah, I, d I don't, you know, they, they have a role to play. Like nobody likes them. It's like nobody likes the U.S. News and World Report rankings of universities or colleges. Um, but but they have a role to play and we shouldn't judge. We, our community should not judge anyone by these made up numbers, uh, impact factor or H index. But when our community or people in our community are viewed outside of our community by people who don't know anything about it, um, then this is where these numbers, you know, are often used. Um, and uh, I think we have to understand that they're not going away, um, but be always vigilant about, you know, not basing any of our own important decisions about people in our community or the direction our community is going on these, you know, just sort of, you know, almost not arbitrary, but like seemingly arbitrary, you know, numeric values. We ourselves can, we can understand and value the, you know, the, the real work as opposed to measuring like all oh, that journal is not good. This journal is good. That, that's nonsense, of course. Mm -hmm. So when hiring uh, young faculties, uh, you know, to these universities, in your case, uh, do you do you guys uh, look uh, closely to these indicators or you appreciate? No, for, hi for hiring, for hiring, we wouldn't, which I think is very good because there were it's someone more close. You know, that's we have we have experts, you know, we are the experts so we can do the evaluation. But where they are used, you know, and our junior faculty suffer from this, you know, when they're putting together tenure packages, they're going to be evaluated by people outside our department, you know, outside our college even, then they have to pay very close attention to what those numbers are. And they are used there. Um, and so mm -hmm. when, when I uh, mentor junior faculty, you say, we have to know what these things are um, and pay attention to them. But it uh, doesn't mean we have to like it. And it doesn't mean that, like, for any decisions that really matter about our field, that they should have, a, have an outsized role. Right. So, Jeff, uh, now I'm going to give you an easy time. <laughs> it's Thank after... you. I'm sweating. <laughs> sweating enough. After bombarding you with uh, somewhat tough questions, uh, I, I would go easy now. So you seem to have a considerable number of followers for an OR person on Twitter. Uh, do you have any idea why? I assume they all come for the human pyramid photos. I, I wouldn't <laughs> know any other reason why anyone would follow me on Twitter. Um, no, I, I, you know, I sometimes I like to I like to put things on Twitter that I find you know, interesting, especially if I can promote uh, junior members of of you know, the optimization community. Um, I'm an editor of the Optimization Online, which is, you know, a, a clearinghouse for white papers and optimization. So like sometimes posting, you know, you know, papers that I see there. I don't know if you'd have to ask my whatever two dozen followers whether you know what what they're what they're coming for you know I, I do like to think that i have a good sense of humor and so i like to sort of sort of joke back and forth with many of my my wide circle of twitter friends so maybe people follow me for my humor i hope they follow me for the human pyramids uh-huh and um uh, do you think that uh the, there's this you know pressure for uh academic performers uh in general are kind of pushing us to make more effort uh, to, to talk about our research uh, work and publicize it more in social media. 
Uh, some some uh, scholars they don't have the the knack for it, and also we are not actually trained for doing that. What is your uh, what are your views on this? You told me you weren't going to ask me any more hard questions or not. <laughs> I'm yeah, just, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. No, I, 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 you know, it is sort of, um, I don't know if it's a, it is a commentary on, on our today's society that, you know, being promoting and even somewhat self-promoting is not a bad thing. Like, this is just what the kids are doing these days. Um, you can try to do it in a, in a more modest way, but you can also, it's nothing wrong about being proud of yourself. If you wrote a paper where you, that you're proud of that work, and no one's really, you know, I think very, it would have to be a very small minded person who would sort of like look askance at someone who just, you know, sort of said, I'm, I'm proud of this work um, on Twitter. So like in that sense, I don't find that especially um, uh, that type of quote unquote self-promotion, especially, you know, bothersome to me. Um, yeah. Did that, I'm not sure. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fine. Okay. Uh, okay. So. To conclude, uh, what are your personal and professional plans for the future? I know you like to garden, but in addition to that. Oh, yeah. Well, on Friday, I'm playing in the uh, Badger Men's Golf League Championship. So I hope on Friday that I can win uh, the, the, my every summer I play in a golf league. So I'm hoping that I can win my golf league on Friday. I usually don't think too much too far into the future. And I'm hoping to get through the get get through. Uh, get through the week. Um, I just, I mean, I really love my colleagues here in Madison. I like, I'm really looking forward to spending, actually spending many more years here. This is the first time that I'm teaching a course in class because I was on sabbatical last year. So it's been more than, you know, two years since I've been in front of a classroom. And, uh, you know, people, a lot of people have asked me, you know, now that you're done being department chair, what are you going to do next? Are you going to be a dean? No. Are you going to go to work at, you know, associate dean? No. Are you going to, are you going to be, go to NSF or work for a government agency? No, probably not. And when I said, you know, I would potentially think about making a change of life if it didn't give me great joy to teach. Um, and we don't, I didn't know, you know, what it was going to be like to be in back in the classroom. It gave me less joy to teach online, you know, not being not being there. Um, and so I will say that it has, it's, I forgot how exhausting it was and how much work it was, but it's, it's the good kind of work. So it really has uh, energized me. So I, I think that I'll, I plan to hopefully be training, training kids in optimization and integer programming uh, here in Madison for many years to come. Right. Uh, you mentioned kids. Uh, do you have any special message for uh, the youngsters? that are interested in studying optimization and OR analytics? Oh, great, great question. Uh, so I think if depending, they probably won't be listening to this, but I'll, I'll tell them. So if it's like a, 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 they say a high school math student or like an undergraduate student, um, I'll tell them what I told uh, my son who's, who's studying, getting actually not a degree in optimization or even industrial engineering, he's getting a degree in mathematics. And I, I told him, you know, when you're young is when the time to learn the fundamentals. Like, so that's like when you're playing sports, you know, first you learn how to grip the golf club or the, or the tennis racket or to dribble the ball. Um, so when you're young is when it's time to focus on the fundamentals and don't, don't get, you know, too, too out in front of your skis. Uh, that, that can come in, uh, in graduate school. Right. So Jeff, it was wonderful to have this conversation with you. I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot from you too. And I hope you also had some fun. And thank you very much. Oh my gosh, Anand, it was uh, the highlight of my week. I enjoyed it very much. And I, and I should say that I think you're doing a great service for our community and having these conversations with different people. I enjoy listening, uh, listening to, the, to them all. Um, and I hope that uh, mine isn't uh, the worst one. No, come on. This one, it was fantastic. And if you're thinking of visiting us or even Brazil, don't forget to, to send me an email and uh, maybe we can adjust for you to have a visit here. That would be lovely. I've, I've never I've never been uh, been there, at least that far, that far north, I think, uh, in Brazil. But I would love to. So let's make it happen. Yeah. So once again, Thank you very, very much and hope to talk to you soon and meet you in person. Bye. 
Oh, wonderful. Ciao. Take care, Anand. Bye-bye. Take care. Ciao.